Clara is a curator, critic, and art historian with a background in literature. She is pursuing research on the politics of breathing in contemporary art and a diversity of art practices using scent as a medium. She has been a writer for the French olfactory magazine Ne since 2016, and you can find out more about her in the link that I'm about to pop in the chat. So, um, Clara? Um, yeah, so you can hear me now, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna try to share this. My talk from last year um, actually took us really far away from Earth because I talked about the artistically reproduced smells of outer space. But today I want to stay in the troposphere, which is actually the part of the atmosphere that's the closest uh, to Earth. And, and we're going to see how olfactory artworks can deal with some of the most urgent issues of the Capitalocene or the Anthropocene, depending on how you want to call it. Um, and so namely the issues related to air and water pollution. So since the 1960s approximately, environmental concerns have increasingly transpired in the visual arts. But pollution, just like climate change in general, um, often remains invisible to the naked eye, which is kind of partly disqualifying vision as an adequate mean for artists to address it. Although artists have tried, and here I just put a picture of a work by Gustav Metzger uh, addressing air pollution, and here you have one by uh, Bright um, Ugo Chukwu Eke uh, addressing atmospheric and water pollution. But uh, today I'll argue that olfactory artworks can be more efficient in terms of addressing these issues and can participate in creating a new narrative that weaves together bodies and ecologies. Um, we say an image is worth a thousand words. I think all of us here would agree that a sense uh, can be worth a thousand images. And so I'll start with air pollution because we have recently seen an increased awareness uh, of the act of breathing, whether because a certain virus has prevented so many of us to breathe normally, uh, not to mention police brutality, if, if it's another subject, but, um, and or because on the contrary, um, lockdowns everywhere have allowed many people to breathe better than before by uh, reducing uh, the amount of pollution in the atmosphere. Like here, you can see New Delhi uh, during um, lockdown. So how aware are we of our breathing? How aware are we of all the things that penetrate our bodies when we breathe, sustaining us, or on the contrary, slowly poisoning us? I'd say we tend to be pretty oblivious of our own respiration, which um, is probably a good thing in a way because it allows us to go by our days without freaking out about this inescapable constant death threat that is air pollution. And I'm really sorry to open that day on that very um, um, sad and threatening note. Uh, but uh, according to the World Health Organization, nine out of 10 people are breathing contaminated air in the world. Um, they also have listed the numerous health disorders air pollution is causing, and they range from smell impairments, um, allergies, asthma, other chronic pulmonary diseases, uh, premature birth, um, chronic stress, autism, various types of cancer. I mean, I'm, I'm going to stop because it's not fun and it's really scary. But yeah, air pollution overall cause, uh, causes diminished physical and mental capacities and increased mortality. It causes 4.2 million um, deaths every year, 7 million, as you can see here, um, if you add household air pollution. And of course, you can also see it on the map, these disastrous effects are evenly affecting people as they follow and intensify geographical, social, racial, and gendered um, inequalities. And so in this context of unprecedented um, health and political crisis, Art has become a crucial channel through which people encounter these issues that they might not think about on a daily basis. And several studies conducted by environmental psychologists have shown that arts tend to be rather impactful where scientific data, um, numbers, graph, and other images addressing air pollution and climate change uh, tend, to, uh, tend to fail to trigger reactions. 
because art demands attention. It triggers emotional responses and it creates moments of reflection that are set apart from everyday lives. Um, but one of the major role of art, more than just showing or telling the story of climate change or air pollution, could actually be to let people personally experience these phenomena, which psychologists have found can be more moving and ultimately might trigger a process of change on a personal level. So I'm sure everyone here has seen the pictures of the smog in Beijing or in New Delhi, but seeing it and knowing about it isn't the same as choking on it. But once you have, you might not want to buy a new car or you might not want to take that plane for your week of vacations because personal experience of this phenomena um, are, is key. And smells and art, because they create an embodied form of experience, prove particularly efficient to uh, bring air, in bringing air, air pollution and the act of breathing to the foreground of our perception and consciousness. Smells within artworks make the air explicit and the act of breathing noticeable. And so I'll start with this very famous piece by Belgian artist Peter de Couperet, whom I'm sure you all know, uh, because it's one of his most famous installation uh, entitled Smoke Cloud. Uh, it offers this delicate image of a fluffy um, cloud made of synthetic uh, cotton in which visitors can dive their heads after climbing a ladder. But instead of getting um, a whiff of crisp and clean air, as, they might, as people might expect, uh, people are welcomed by the cringing smell of air pollution. De Cooper is a specialist uh, of these contrasted impressions between the visual and the olfactory dimensions of his work. Um, and for someone witnessing the installation, although the absorption of the head of the visitor by the cloud might look a little bit dreamy, it's kind of beautiful and poetic, um, it can also be a powerful uh, metaphor as the smeller is virtually beheaded by the installation. But the real potency of that piece resides in the very act of inhalation and not in how it looks. Um, while the process of vision is uh, linked to objectifying thought, breathing on the contrary blends the limits. And so by defying pure opticality and making visitors literally absorb the air pollution problem, such a work, um, as well as the others I'm going to talk about after, um, such a work challenged the narrative of an exteriorized environment. Because the idea of the divide between nature and culture, between subject and object, has led to a faulty conception of nature as something as exterior to us. And thus alienated, nature has become um, an object of aesthetic contemplation for some, but also an exploitable commodity for others. And so it is necessary to challenge its premise to embrace the simple idea that all bodies are porous and that we always do to ourselves what we do to nature. And so such transcorporeal enmeshments, which tend to elude us in our everyday lives, are rendered obvious by olfactory artworks such as this one, because you are in it as much as they are in you. And so I'll skip to another ambitious, rather ambitious artwork on the subject, uh, which is Pollution Parts by British artist Michael Pinsky. Um, this installation was commissioned by Climart, which is a research project led by the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, and it was a project to study the psychological mechanisms involved in the reception of climate change related, uh, related arts. And so they were driven by the idea of creating um, concrete, um, emotional and personal experience to address um, issues around climate change. And so pollution part consists of, you can barely see it, but five um, interconnected geodesic domes that are arranged in a circle. And um, the first dome welcomes visitors in the remarkably pure air of um, the peninsula of Totra in, in Norway. But each dome beyond this one contains a replica of the specific air quality of four major cities, Beijing, New Delhi, Sao Paulo, and London. And these re reproductions are based on scientific data and empirical experience by perfumers living in each of these cities. And again, so the pollution is mimicked through temperature setting, um, fog and scent, because exposing visitors to the actual chemicals present in these cities' atmospheres uh, which was the original idea, um, would have faced immediate interdiction from health and safety authorities, which is really ironic, right? 
Um, but this piece, beyond the story of how humans and atmospheres and nature are enmeshed in one another, um, another story told by Pollution Pods is a story of global interconnectedness and of global disparities. And so although there are no borders to restrain the air or the clouds, and even if air is uh, globally shared, each local pollution is still its own daily cocktail. And as you could maybe um, see on the map I showed, uh, I, sh I showed from the World Health Organization, um, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific, all the most severely affected areas by air pollution. Um, in part because of the delocalization of Western polluting industries in the global south. And so Pollution Pods as an artwork successfully captures these geopolitical dynamics through the differentiated air qualities in each pod. Um, the work was uh, exhibited in a dozen northern countries uh, in the last few years. It was recently shown in New York in front of the UN. Um, and so it allowed this elusive but pervasive violence to be experienced by the people um, who are usually the most spared by it um, in America or in Europe while unknowingly participating the most in it. And so by challenging people's sense of safety, by letting them experience what other people on the other side of the planet um, are experiences, the installation raises a form of embodied empathy towards the ones who are most affected by air pollution, but while also mobilizing um, major political reflections regarding geographic disparities, um, urbanization, industrial um, societies, global neoliberal economy, um, and uh, overall Western domination. Um, so that's it because I have to go really quick over its work, but um, yeah, so, but such uh, environmental disparities are also prevalent within countries, uh, so locally within regions and within cities. Uh, where some communities, and namely people of color, indigenous people, working class people, and overall impoverished populations um, are disproportionately subjected to environmental risk. And so this work, Kinder, COC, blah, 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 I'm not going to read everything, uh, it's a um, chemical formula. Um, so this work by American artist Amy Yao um, implicitly addresses such uh, local disparities. Um, the piece was composed of, as you can barely see it, it was composed of a sense um, created in collaboration with artist Trent Raspit. And this intoxicating aroma was emanating from an industrial diffuser uh, sitting on the floor uh, that was filling up the white cube space with, um, with a scent. And it was presented in, a, in the artist in Amy Yeo's gallery in, in Los Angeles. And the scent was inspired by Amy Yeo's memories of Garb of um, scratch and sniff stickers um, from the 70s and the 80s, bearing pictures and smells of garbage and car exhaust, um, which is kind of um, awful if you think about it, because it's like they were preparing children to live in a polluted world. Um, but these memories um, also merged uh, in this work with more recent experiences by Amy Yeo in the vicinity of a studio that was then located in San Pedro Bay um, between the Los Angeles and Long Beach harbors, which is one of the most polluted industrial era areas in, in, in the United States. And so unsurprisingly, the people living and working in this area are mostly Latino and African Americans. And so what's most, in, in, what's most interesting with this piece is not, um, not just only um, how the smell allowed, again, for an embodied experience of air pollution. What's really interesting is how is the meaningful and symbolic relations that between this scent and the, and the space it was dispersed in. Because the white cube um, gallery space uh, which appeared uh, in the early 20th century and has become the norm in most modern and contemporary arts um, spaces, is supposed to be an enclosed, um, isolated, geometric, uh, geometric, clean, and absolutely deodorized space, something that art historian Jim, Dro Dream, Dro sorry, Jim Dropnik has um, discussed many times. It's a space that um, should be separated from the external world to allow artworks to be contemplated without any um, sensory interferences with the gaze. That's how the white cube has been constructed as both a physical and an ideological space. 
So through the olfactive contamination of the space that has stemmed from various systems of cultural and economic domination, the space uh, kinder physically and symbolically brings the air pollution that prevalently, prevalently affects underprivileged people uh, into this salubrious um, elite territory that is the gallery space. Um, and typically the low income communities that are most affected by airborne risks are uh, like the people living in San Pedro Bay, for example, or the same people that are largely excluded from such art spaces. And so the smell uh, created by the artists um, infiltrating the white cube sort of unveiled these mechanisms of environmental racism, but it also suggested the failure of the gallery space air conditioning the failure of this climate control system that is both real as well as symbolic, the system that usually prevents the exterior world from penetrating the white cube and that therefore preserves it, preserves it as a space of privilege. And when talking about the piece, Amy Yao said that she didn't want people to forget the stink that enables modern life as we know it. Um, this is what I would call the discriminatory stink of the capitalism. And okay, because uh, yeah, we have a very limited time, so I'll skip over several notions and ideas and all the artworks um, addressing these issues, um, because I want to also talk about even very quickly, um, I don't know how much time I have, okay. um, even quickly, I wanna talk about um, artworks addressing water pollution, which might be a little less obvious uh, to address through smells because um, unless you're a mermaid, you're not breathing water. Um, but still, smells have appeared to many artists as, a, as to be a relevant, um, a relevant way to uh, address water pollution, uh, probably in part because of the, again, transcorporeal nature shared by both smell or air and water. Um, water is something that you incorporate just like smells in air. It's something that you can immerse yourself in just like smells in air. And just like air, it's something that is vital, something that if it's polluted can easily uh, become deadly. Um, and so, and such pollution, even in water, can sometimes be sniffed out. Animals uh, sniff their um, sniff water to decide whether it's drinkable or not. And in that sense, we are still very much animals. And there's a work by Filipino artist, um, Goldie Poblador, um, that I wanted to show. It's, uh, it's a piece based on her experience of water pollution in her native country, uh, where rivers used to be clean when she was young, but uh, have gotten really polluted in the last two decades. After leaving her country for a few years, she realized when she came back to the Philippines that the smell of the rivers had changed. And so she designed this uh, blown glass bottle um, with this kind of go virusy shape uh, to contain water sampled from different rivers in the Philippines. And she worked with chemists to amplify the rotten fish smell of these samples and to draw attention to these um, alterations of the quality of water but she's kind of an exception in, in the way she addresses um, water pollution because many artists, the approach many artists have um, taken to address pollution, the pollution of water is actually quite different. Many of them are using um, not what could be called mimesis, so what we've seen uh, until now, that's like the reproduction or representation of pollution through scent substitutes. Many artists are using some of the actual products um, causing water pollution uh, in ways that highlight their toxicity. And these products are usually heavily scented. Um, here you have an example by Erika Ernawan, who's an Ind Ind Indonesian artist, um, who experienced kind of the same realization as Goldie in the Philippines. So when Erika came back to her home city after living abroad for a few years, the pollution of rivers in Banduk had reached critical levels. And so back in Germany, she worked on a show entitled Rest in Peace about the relations between bodies, water, and the environment. And in one of the works in the show that you can see here, she hung herself upside down over a stainless um, steel pound filled with greenish mouthwash. 
um, next to that, people could read a sentence, you can't see it here, that read, um, the environment is the living space of humans, beast, and money. So it was a critical take on the way capitalism is exploiting nature without considering the damages it inflicts on it, on other humans and on non-humans. And here, the synthetic odor that pervaded the space, giving a false sense of cleanliness, performed as a cultural signifier, embodying um, the paradox between the promise of, of hygiene, freshness of mouthwash, and its latent toxicity, um, either when ingested or when released into the water system. And actually, there are several um, earlier works by French artist uh, Boris Faux, who I'm sure you also know, um, that relied on the same kind of cultural constructs uh, around hygiene products. Um, he did many uh, artworks, but this one, the swimming pool, um, is interesting because it looked like uh, a, a small blue pool, quiet, um, peaceful, um, but the pool was filled with fabric softener. Um, and so it filled the, the negative space around it, so the atmosphere above it, with volatile molecules. Um, and it made the space into this atmospheric pool that visitors were immersed in, um, kind of drowning in the heady sense, heady sense sorry, of, um, in the toxic emanations of the product, um, suffocating in a way like um, aquatic organisms are suffocating when such products are released in nature. And so again, um, a scent that was designed to convey ideas of cleanliness and softness and comfort um, at this concentration, very heavy concentration, clearly reveals its toxicity, its toxicity for us and its toxicity for the ecosystems. Um, because some of the chemicals components uh, of la laundry detergents and fabric softener like this one um, are extremely polluting because they aren't properly filtered um, in the purification process of water. And so they end up in rivers and they end up in the sea. Um, which is also what is suggested, and I'm sorry I'm going so fast over the artworks, um, but yeah, this is the last one I wanted to, to mention. Um, it's a piece by um, Swiss artist Catherine Bodmer, um, dates back from 1998, and it's entitled uh, Sea Spray in English. And it's a piece made out of soap powder, creating a floor drawing evoking um, the sea. But in this work, I mean, you have all the mechanisms I just described about previous works, but in this work, she was also critically engaging um, with the ideological and actual climate control atmosphere of art galleries again, um, because she she is basically talking about the white cube's obsession with purity and neutrality, where deodorization and sanitizing go hand in hand with gentrification and notions of pu purification. Um, so the artist reimposes the smell of purity. I mean something we associate to purity in uh, North America, um, to the ideological purity and visual whiteness that are constitutive of the white cube as um, a space of exclusion and domination. So by concentrating the smell or the product to the point of becoming physically threatening, it suggests the dangers of such ideological constructs along with the dangers of environmental pollution. And so all of these olfactory artworks that I've talked about, they all convey a feeling of vulnerability, which is another major reason why smells are particularly effective and appropriate to tackle pollution issues. Because even without talking about the whole miasma theories, um, well, if you just look, look at smell uh, from the point of view of evolution, um, the sense of smell has been, has been biologically designed uh, by evolution to be a survival tool. And so survival is precisely what is at stake when dealing with water and, um, and air pollution. Because other is suggesting harmful substances or, or harmful situations, dangerous situations, they tend to trigger universal biological rejection because the nose knows what's bad and what's good. And so um, the reason why um, olfactory information travels particularly fast between 
um, the epithelium where it's detected and the uh, olfactory bulb where it's processed is because its messages are urgent in nature. The sense of smell is meant to, um, oops, sorry, to orient behaviors um, and to provoke uh, instinctive reactions. So it can be gag reflex or sneezing or coughing or just twitching one's nose, um, for instance. The sense of smell is meant to trigger quick decisions to avoid danger too. So usually it's like run or um, stop breathing, hold your breath, don't drink that, this kind of instinctive, uh, very quick reactions. Um, and so building on this biological aspect, olfactory artworks overcome one major obstacle uh, identified um, in climate communication, which is to engage people across or despite cultural and individual differences. And the threats on health posited by air and water pollution and rendered explicit by these artworks is a universally shared concern. It's a bodily concern. Uh, it's transcending cultures, languages, religion, worldviews, um, values, subjectivities, uh, and all of that. Um, and so actually um, reactions to pollution parts, for example, have included uh, coughing, crying, scratching and sore throats, and a tendency to escape the pods as fast as possible. Um, Amy Yao have also reported that many visitors thought her work was actually toxic and didn't want to stay too long um, in the room. Um, in these cases, instinctive reactions prevailed over reason. Um, although the scents were innocuous, they were perceived as, as threatening and to the point uh, of inducing involuntary um, defense mechanisms. And some works by uh, Boris Faux and Catherine Bonnemer also faced actual interdiction because they were considered too dangerous um, to be um, uh, exhibited in galleries. Uh, and maybe they were a little toxic, uh, but no more in art form that, than in our everyday lives when we are exposing ourselves to these chemicals. And so my conclusion would be that the experience of such artworks actively transforms what we might feel is a distant or abstract threat into a very concrete one. Olfactory artworks can trigger intellectual, physical and emotional reactions, uh, playing in between cultural and social constructs on the one hand and basic biology on the other hand. They offer a first person experience, they offer a sense of enmeshment, of fusion with the world, and they work on an instinctive level to suggest danger. And so they are also capable, and that's interesting, of, uh, they're capable of addressing these issues um, also in a critical way that raises political concerns pertaining to the causes of pollution and environmental justice. And so in short, olfactory artworks meet most of the requirements for an effective intercultural climate communication to create this new shared narrative this new shared understanding and perception of our world's diversely polluted um, vital resources. And thus these artworks urge us to take action. And I am done. And I think we still have maybe five minutes for questions. And I'm sorry if I was a bit long. Hey, Clara. <laughs> um, just kind of uh, bringing a bit the background of the experimental sense to me where where there are indie perfumers, perfumers and artists. I'm wondering um, what's your view on the toxicity of sand pieces in museums? Like, um, do you think artists have to feel responsible as perfumers do have some responsibility on health or because it's art, it's supposed to, you know, just kind of display a warning and then it's up to the audience. I'm just wondering, what your thoughts are. I don't really know where I stand personally. I'm, I'm sure, sh I know Sean has uh, written about that uh, and, and thought about it. Um, but, and I had this discussion with um, Gail Nels, who's also an olfactory artist based in New York. And she's really, um, she strongly advocates for artists to use only natural, uh, non-toxic uh, products uh, when they, are creating olfactory artworks, which I think makes definitely makes sense. Um, and I'm kind of all in for um, the freedom of art 
and the freedom of the artist to use whatever materials, but I also completely understand when a gallerist who's pregnant uh, refuses a piece by Boris to be exhibited because she thinks it's going to be toxic for her. Uh, what's kind of ironic is that the same person who's not willing to exhibit this work might be exposing herself to the same chemicals um, when she's doing laundry every day for the rest of her life. So I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I don't really have a position on that, I think. Um, it's just good for people when they're um, like jumping at the throat of artists for using this kind of, uh, of products that are definitely toxic, uh, just to be reminded or remind themselves that they are exposed to uh, way higher concentrations of such product in their everyday lives. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Clara, thank you so much for your time and your, your presentation. Okay.